You know, all of us are here because we are seeking not just meaning in our positions, but purpose as well. And your purpose is your why. Your purpose is what got you to do this job in the first place. And I think we can all think back to when we started on this job, and we can recall something to the effect of we wanted to help people. That was our purpose. And our job is inherently meaningful in law enforcement because we work in public service. But what drives you? Your purpose is your why. What brought you here? What brought you to this position? And are you living that purpose currently in your day-to-day -day life as an officer? You know, for me, I started on this job young. I was 22 years old. I knew nothing about life, never mind the police profession. And I started thinking about how I wanted to help people and what this job was going to look like. And when I started in this profession, I quickly realized that even though I was service-minded, I was told, be rigid, don't be compassionate, be robotic. And that wasn't me, but I felt that I had to be somebody else's version of what a police officer was. And so I did that. And well into my training, um, going through field training and working with officers, I quickly realized that everybody had kind of adopted that mindset. You know, we would go on different calls, and one of my first calls was with a 19-year-old girl who was addicted to heroin. And I started working in the hometown where I grew up, and I couldn't believe that these things were happening right under my nose, and I had no idea, and I'm sure you can all relate. And I remember talking with this girl and having so much compassion for her. And everybody told me things like, don't even bother. You know, she grew up in a broken home. Don't bother. You're never going to change her. And I remember that hitting me like a ton of bricks and thinking, well, what's the point? Why, why are we here? Why are we doing this then? And so as my years progressed, I quickly fell into this slippery slope of despair. And I started feeling like I couldn't affect change. I couldn't make a difference. And then I found mindfulness. Mindfulness has become a buzzword over the past couple of years. And people think, you know, it's a fad, it's going to come and go. Well, mindfulness has been around for many, many years. And all mindfulness is, is paying attention to your life on purpose, in the present moment, without judgment, with kindness and curiosity. And that's a definition by Dr. Amy Saltzman. And it's one of the best definitions I've seen. And I practice this in my daily life. Because if I can wake up each day and think that I have today, I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to affect one person today. All I'm focusing on is today. I'm not worrying about tomorrow. I'm not worrying about some of the systemic issues in society. And that's the bigger picture thinking, but I can't affect the bigger picture if I'm not worrying about just today and who I'm going to affect today. So how do we create change in our communities? How do we help the people that we see on a daily basis? Because as police officers and supervisors and chiefs, we're getting the questions all the time from the public. What are you doing about gun violence? What are you doing about the opioid crisis? And our answer is, well, you know, we have needle exchange programs. You know, we've got you know, some um, crisis intervention teams that are coming in and helping. But when I really started self-reflecting and thinking about the ways in which we respond to our calls for service, I started thinking about that definition of mindfulness. And I started approaching every call that I went on with kindness and curiosity. And when I utilized the lens of curiosity, I was able to see that people in our society were broken. The adults were broken, but they were mendable, okay? And we need to think about how we can build strong children in our communities so that we can reach people and get people to that level where they're becoming good citizens of our societies. And that's how we affect change. I'm often reminded of this painting Norman Rockwell, it's a favorite among law enforcement, and it's a favorite of mine. My father was a trooper, actually looks just like the, the trooper in this photo, in this painting. And this picture hung in my house for the majority of my life, and that was my perception of a police officer. It was somebody who was helping. You know, here was this trooper helping this child who had run away, and that was what I wanted to do. That was what drove me to this job. And Norman Rockwell, he painted the America that he saw. He painted an America that was about connection and about community. If you look at any of his paintings, you'll see that. It's about the community coming together to help. And people will often say to me, you know, Michelle, that's not our job as police officers. It's not our job to fix the broken society. It's not our job to fix children. That's the parents' job. That's the problem of children and families. That, that's not our issue. But if we start to look at what's going on in our society and what's going on with our youth, 
we see that our children are being failed by one or more systems in our society. And we can all point the finger and say, well, they're not doing their job. Neither are they, neither are they. But neither are we, if we have that attitude. So we need to think about ways we can bring the community together. So I started thinking about a way we could do this in a method, in a model. And I put together a program called LEAP, which stands for Leadership, Empowerment, Awareness, and Protection. And what I was trying to get at with this program was really create a program that was curriculum based that officers could teach to youth that would teach them these critical skills for success. I wanted to teach them about thoughts, feelings, and emotions. I wanted to teach them coping skills because we all know any officer can stand up in front of a group of children and talk about drugs and why drugs are bad and what kind of drugs are out there. But if we're not preventing kids from utilizing drugs in the first place, we're not doing our job. So I started researching and what I found out were a number of things about children. We know that 1.7 million children in this country have an incarcerated parent. And 30% of those children will follow in their parents' footsteps. We know that our children are facing trauma in their daily life. And trauma can be anything from the divorce of a parent to something you know, violently traumatic that occurs in their childhood. And one in four children will experience a traumatic event before the age of 16. We know that in order for our kids to be successful, they need to be seen, safe, and secure. And we know that our kids are dying for connection. And if we can create a culture where the community has come together to support the child, they're gonna receive that connection that they need with an interested adult. I'm going to share with you a story about one of the kids in my community. And I'm going to share with you some of the breakdown of the adults around this child, who I'm going to call Matthew for privacy reasons. So Matthew was a child who was getting in a lot of trouble in school. He was like your typical problem kid. Um, he was posting things on social media that was violent. People were scared. People thought you know, he was going to do something violent to the school. Um, he was also selling drugs in the school, allegedly. That turned out to be false information, but people thought he was selling drugs. So this kid came on my radar, and people were saying, you know, Michelle, what do you think we should do about this? And I said, well, what's his background? What's going on in his life? And I actually had another adult say to me, well, yeah, his dad died when he was a kid, but, you know, he was like four, so he doesn't, you know, probably doesn't remember. He's just got to get over it, move on. That's a problem. We need to shift our way of thinking. When I met with Matthew's mother, she came in for a meeting, and it was a couple of school principals, myself, guidance counselor, we're all sitting around the table. And this mother started telling her story and telling us how she, when she was 17 years old, she got pregnant. She had Matthew. Her and Matthew's father ended up um, going their separate ways when he was about eight months old. And they co-parented, but she found out when Matthew was probably about three years old that her ex had been using heroin on a consistent basis. So she quickly removed Matthew from that situation, didn't allow him to see his son, and a few months after that, he passed away from a heroin overdose. She was in tears. She was upset in this meeting. She said how hard it was to raise this child by herself. And I had a great deal of compassion for her because several years ago when I started practicing mindfulness and I started to see that my experiences of pain and suffering weren't any different than somebody else's. We all experienced that. And I was able to have a level of compassion for her. And after that meeting was over, I got an email from her. And she said, I just want to thank you for being the only person in that room who connected with me and didn't judge me. She said, I felt like you could feel what was in my heart. I felt like you could understand what I was going through on a deeper level. And that was so deeply meaningful for me to read that because I knew that I'm building relationships, I'm building connection, and that's what we need to be doing. So I kind of took Matthew under my wing. I utilized some of the programs, uh, some of the LEAP programs that I had developed, and I gave him little lessons here and there. But mostly I connected with him and I believed in him. And after a couple of months, I saw that Matthew actually wasn't getting in trouble. I went into his disciplinary record, and he hadn't been in any trouble in about two months. So I said, you know what, I'm going to call him in. I'm going to give him some positive reinforcement. 
So I gave him um, a small gift card that he could go and use, and I told him how proud I was of him of you know, doing the right thing. Because these are the kids that we need to wrap our arms around. Whether it's us, whether it's somebody else in the community, we need to come at this with a collaborative approach to raise these kids, because he is a statistic. He's going to be one of the kids that we deal with on a regular basis, and we say, oh, him again. Yeah, he's a regular customer of ours. We deal with him all the time. He's an addict, or he's always you know, engaging in um, destructive behaviors, domestic violence. We need to fix this problem now, OK? I'm one person. He's one child. But if we all have that philosophy and we all have that mentality, we're going to change a number of children. And we're going to create kids who are good citizens of our societies. So Matthew's story doesn't end there. I actually got called down to the principal's office about 15 minutes after I gave Matthew the gift card. And the principal said, you know, he was kind of skipping down the hallway and he was so excited and showing everyone his gift card. And I'm like, so? <laughs> What's the problem with that? And she said, well, some of the teachers are upset because, you know, Matthew, you know, he still is having some behavioral issues and his grades aren't great. And, you know, we don't typically reward kids for doing what they're supposed to do. And I said, well, Matthew's not like every other kid. Matthew lost his father at the age of four to a heroin overdose, and he knows that. And he's still processing that, and he's still trying to figure out his place in this world with a mother who works two jobs trying to support him and adults who don't believe in him. That's the problem. People weren't believing in him. So the next day, I come into work, and overnight, you know, this is what we do as humans. You know, we process things. We think about things, and I'm like, geez, did I do the wrong thing? You know, should I not have rewarded him, even though I knew in my heart that was the right thing to do? So I'm thinking about it all night. And the next morning, I come in, and I get this letter in the mailbox that I have at the school, which I'm going to read to you. To Officer Palladini, sorry if I spelt your name wrong, thank you so much for the gift card. It means a lot. You actually made my day. Thank you for being by my side throughout this year. You genuinely make the middle school a better place for me to socialize, work, and most of all, learn. You understand me and make me feel at home with the conversations we have with each other. Thank you again, Detective Palladini. Again, sorry if I spelt your name wrong. That let me know that I was doing my job, that I was making a difference for one kid, and I'd continue to do the same for the next child. And the way that I do this and the way that I've packaged this up is with a clues model. And this is part of what I train other officers in. And it's helping us create success stories like this in our own community. And we're used to looking for clues. We're always looking for probable cause. This is what we do as officers. But clues is actually an acronym here for collaboration, listening, understanding, empathizing, and seeking solutions. If we approach every situation with this in mind, this is the curiosity. This is what makes a difference for the people that we work with because we're able to look at things through this lens. We need to collaborate with our community partners. I encourage you to find out who is available in your community that you can network with. And you know where I find these people? I find them in the coffee shop. You know, I engage people in conversation. I've met therapists. I've met mental health counselors. I have met people that work in social service. And I put all these phone numbers in my phone and I stay connected with these people. Because when I have a situation that I can't handle, because I'm a police officer and it's not really within my purview, but I can direct this person to somebody else. So instead of leaving that call saying, hey, good luck with your 15-year-old son, like, that's not a good situation, sorry, and leaving. We can leave them with a resource. Hey, you know what, I have this really great person. She specializes in anger management. This should be helpful for you and your family. So we collaborate. We listen. And so many of us listen with the intent to reply, not with the intent to understand. And that is what we do in law enforcement. We're always thinking one step ahead. I have to solve this. I have to solve this right now. I need to fix this problem. So we're not really listening to what the person is telling us. Our mind is elsewhere. And that's mindfulness too, staying in the present moment. We need to think about the conversations that we're having with people and making sure that we are listening for the intent to understand. When we can truly understand people and we reach people with that level of authenticity, we do make a difference. Because we know at the end of the day, people just want to be heard. 
People want to tell their story. And so often I have people that will talk to me, and I sit there and I listen, and they're like, oh, I just feel better you know, getting that off my chest. But we don't want to do that in law enforcement. It's, we've been on this call for 10 minutes. We want to go. That's not protecting and serving at all. So we need to rethink the way that we're handling our calls for service and the people that we work with, which leads us to empathy. It's a scary word for us in law enforcement, sharing in the feelings of another person, because we're taught, don't be human. Don't bring your work home with you. Don't have empathy for that person. Don't have compassion. He made that choice himself. He chose to become a heroin addict. No, no. Use the clues model and follow it back. You will see that there are traumatic roots to most of these people's issues, okay? There is a lot more behind the story. We need to look for those clues, and then we need to find solutions for these people. And our solutions can be a variety of things. It can be using our collaborative network. It can be thinking outside of the box. We need to be flexible thinkers now in law enforcement. It's our duty. And I'm gonna close with something that happened with Matthew this year. This year, I started a new initiative within the LEAP program, and it's called In Four Words. And the kids have to come in, and they have to create a positive affirmation using only four words. So Matthew comes in, and I said, hey, I want you to try this activity. He says, all right. And this is what he came up with. Strength starts with weakness. Profound. Strength starts with weakness. So think about the work that you do and where we're at in law enforcement, and where we're at in our communities. And think about your strengths. Think about your purpose. And take away from this that your purpose isn't out there. Your purpose isn't here. And when we can protect and serve and police from our heart and from what we know is right, we are going to make a difference in our communities. We're gonna protect and serve in the very best way we know how. That's what I encourage all of you to do. Thanks so much.